Good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Hagen. I am the executive director of the US ETDA, and it's my pleasure today um, to introduce the and to facilitate and moderate the next panel discussion, the Survey of Earned Doctorates, Tips on Compliance, Privacy, and Institutional Data Resources. Um, today we have Pat Green and Peter Einaudi from RTI International. Um, and uh, so this plenary panel does a presentation will explore, explore the Survey of Earned Doctorates. Oh, can you guys mute? I hear an echo. Peter and Pat. Can you mute your audio? And Pat? Okay, I, the echo's gone, so we're good. Uh, this plenary panel discussion will explore the Survey of Earned Doctorates, or SED. Um, we will begin with an overview of the survey and its uses, best practices to motivate respondents, and improved access to survey data using new data tools that can be used for analysis and planning. So um, Patricia Green is one of the RTI International Senior Experts in Education Research. She brings an academic background in sociology in her, uh, to her leadership roles on many of her uh, major surveys and studies for the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, foundations, and other major private and public sector clients. Currently, she directs two surveys for the National Science Foundation, the Survey of Earned Doctorates, which is the census of all students receiving uh, research doctorates in the United States, and the Survey of Graduate Students and Postdoctorates in Science and Engineering, which, prov which provides data on trends in graduate enrollment and financial support. Um, she's also designed and directed studies across all levels of schooling in the U.S. and China, including the administration of international assessments in uh, U.S. elementary and secondary schools. So Peter Einaudi is a director of education and research at RTI International with more than 20 years of work experience in the corporate and academic settings. Uh, he has expertise in survey methodology, data analysis, quality management, and systems design. Since joining RTI in 2006, um, he's led data delivery and dissemination tasks for multiple large federal surveys, and he was the project director for the National Science Foundation's early career doctorate survey. Uh, currently, he's leading several method methodological um, tasks for the survey of earned doctorates, including exploring the use of data analytic techniques to develop a taxonomy of research topics from dissertation titles and associated metadata. That sounds really cool. Um, he received uh, his bachelor's degree from mathematics at Harvard University and a master's degree in sociology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Peter to run the slideshow. And uh, go ahead, guys. And Peter, go ahead and uh, start your screen sharing. Yes, please. Oh, and Peter, you would need to unmute if you need to start a talk as well, too. Pat, can you hear? Yes, we can hear you, Pat. You're breaking up a little bit, but um, let's see if we can go forth. Uh, Peter, we're having a lot of audio glitches. I wonder if Pat needs to do the same thing, um, get out and come back in. It seems like it did improve it. I don't know if you can begin her, her presentation for her or... Um. I can try. Well, hold on a second. Hey, Pat, we're having big audio problems. Can you try and jump uh, out and come back in like you did? OK. Audience, please bear with us. Uh, so I should mention, and I should have mentioned this earlier in the session, um, if you have questions please uh, for the panelists please enter them in the Q&A um, tab and um, then I'll call upon folks uh, along the way and at the end of the session um, if you'd like to ask your question live that's great if not I'll be happy to read it to our panelists in the audience um, from the Q&A tab if you'd like to chat amongst yourselves you can certainly use the um, chat tab
Okay, so Pat is going to try um, logging in with her Mac as opposed to uh, her other computer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, and uh, hopefully um, I haven't practiced her section, but maybe uh, I think it'll be okay. Um, we'll pull and, together. Thank and, you. And hopefully Peter. she can uh, she can do it when when she logs in. She can take over. Okay, great. So, Thank you. Um, our agenda for for this plenary is to you know give a brief overview of the survey of earned doctorates, um, talk about institution and student participation, um, new changes or or what we've done for privacy and confidentiality, and some some uh, new and exciting things we're doing on, on that front, and then talk about data uses by institutions and others, um, and then how to access your data. Um, so that's part of that last section. Um, so in terms of the overview, uh, the survey of earned doctorates is a census of all research, um, uh, of all research doctorates in the United States, okay, who are getting, uh, the, there are the people who are graduating this year within a year cycle, um, that are getting their degree. It should be a census of all people with, with research, uh, doctorates. So it's not professional doctorates. Um, it's not practitioner um, level uh, doctorate degrees, but rather all PhDs, EDDs, um, you know, SCs and uh, other types of doctorate degrees. Um, it Peter? is, yeah. Oh, I can hear you perfectly. Yes, it sounds wonderful. Okay. Okay, go ahead and take over. Yeah, so we. I was just starting, so go ahead. Okay, so, um... I think you were just talking about research doctorates, that professional doctorates are not um, included in the study. It really is oriented toward research. So next slide. Okay, so who sponsors the SCD? There are four sponsors. NSF is the lead sponsor, and they are the ones that are responsible for actually conducting the survey. NIH, the Department of Education, and um, National Endowment for the Humanities also contribute to the study. And uh, both Peter and I work for RTI International, and we're under contract to NSF to actually conduct the study. All phases from, you know, developing the instruments to collecting all the data to um, analyzing and reporting. Next. Okay, what is the purpose of the SCD? It is to collect information on the doctoral recipient's educational history, demographic characteristics, and post-graduation plans. You know, this study has been going since the, I think it was first done in 1958. Um, so it, it really is possible to examine trends in many areas, both um, the representation of women, minorities, and foreign nationals, uh, emergence of new fields of study, and uh, postdoctoral employment opportunities. We examine fields of study every other year to see if there are new um, fields that should be included in the taxonomy. And just a side note, this year um, we changed and we're now using the SIP codes, course and instructional program codes, rather than the SED field of study codes, although we'll still be reporting um, by those codes. Uh, this data set is used by many people, both at the institution level, often at the state level, and certainly at the national level to determine if there needs to be changes in the way um, money is distributed across institutions and graduate programs, um, and to benchmark, you know, what is really happening. Next slide. Okay, so there are two ways that doctorate recipients can complete the SED, either online via web instrument, which is like almost everyone, and via CADI, Computer Assisted Telephone Interviewing. If um, students haven't responded, like when they're on campus and have been asked to do it, and they don't respond to our um, emails and other contacts, the sort of last resort is to go to telephone interviews, and that's an abbreviated interview. We no longer use the paper questionnaire at all. Zero paper questionnaires this year. Last year we had maybe 10. And um, so we're very pleased with that. 
next. Okay, if you want more information, this is the SED information website. Um, the address is up in the top corner, and also these slides are all online um, on the uh, website with the presentation, so you can consult that if you want to find this website. Next. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about institution and student participation. You might have noticed that I changed compliance in the title to participation because really this study, you know, it's not, there are no federal regulations really regarding it. We have no sticks, you know, it really is um, because people want to do this study and contribute to it. So next slide. Okay, the role of institutions. Um, I have to thank all of you. I mean, the institutional participation is really what allows the study to happen. First, most institutions make the initial contact with students when they file for graduation. And then secondly, institutions confirm which people actually did graduate with each graduation ceremony. So, um, you know, this is a critical activity and we really couldn't do the study without that. Next. Institutions also have a role in non-response follow-up. When we get the graduation list from the universities, we match them with the completes that we have on file, people who completed the web instrument. And then we post on the, there's an administrative tool, institutional coordinator, administrative tool, the ICAT. We post all the um, people on the graduation list and whether or not they have completed the survey. Some institutions prompt non-responding students. Other ones, um, we ask them, the school to provide a graduate, uh, address roster so that we can begin prompting. And then near the end of data collection, we ask institutions to provide critical items for non-responding students. Next. Okay, so you can see there are three times that we go to institutions to ask for information. Um, and each time, fewer and fewer institutions and students are on these lists. Ideally, if people really responded right away, the only thing we would ask for is that initial graduation list because everyone would complete the survey. But we do go back and ask for address rosters um, for the non-respondents. And then at the very end, the missing information rosters for the total non-respondents, um, the data elements on that request are shown on this slide. It's very basic information that analysts need to really analyze the SED and also it's used as a sampling frame for the survey of doctorate recipients. Next. Okay, SED non-respondent follow-up is also done by RTI. RTI prompts non-respondents via email, to providing them a link to the survey. Um, if they don't respond to our emails, then we send hard copy mailings with links. And then finally, we have telephone interviewers who contact non-respondents. And at that time, they can choose either to complete a short caddy survey that really basically asks only critical items, um, or if they prefer, uh, the interviewer can automatically send them a link to the survey again, and they go on the web. And I would say it's about 50-50, you know. Some of them haven't responded because we had bad email addresses or bad snail mail addresses, and once we get a phone, they are willing to participate. Next. So, um, we've been very successful with this methodology. Approximately 92% of doctor recipients complete the survey cycle each year. Um, and I think, you know, people as they file to get their PhD, they're usually pretty darn happy. You know, it's like the end of a very long road and they're very proud of themselves. And um, most of them are willing to share their experiences and respond to the survey. And I have to thank all the institutions because they work hard um, to have their students complete the survey. 
next. So here are actually the response rates by school. So we have about 570 schools in um, the survey. It varies each year because you know, schools can be just one school at a university or could be, you know, other universities report for the entire, all the schools there. Um, and the 60% um, of all schools have student response rates that are 90% or higher, which is fabulous. And another 21% have um, response rates that are over 70, but less than 90. So only 19% of schools have response rates that are less than 70 percent and we do identify actually we identify all the schools with less than 80 percent response rates and um, often contact them and try to figure out what we could do to help or you know share with them ideas for what they could do we also traditionally until the pandemic do several site visits a year to schools that have a sudden drop in their response rates to see if we can figure out, um, you know, how we can help them move those response rates up. Next. Okay, and here are some of the best practices that we found steps to achieve high response rates. Um, the most important one is if you have a graduation checklist, make sure to put the link to the SED on that graduation checklist. If you don't have a graduation checklist, if you can distribute the web survey link three to four months prior to graduation, you know, that would be great. Um, and then finally, another uh, option is to link the SED survey to your institution's exit survey, if you have one. That way um, you can sort of deduplicate the questions and reduce the burden on the students, make it faster than for them to respond. And we will send you preliminary data files. You know, we can send them every quarter or however often you want so that you can merge that data with your own exit survey data on a timely basis. Next. Okay, and more steps to improve response rates. I think I'm going over. Um, monitoring student participation um, and providing graduation lists as soon as possible. Sometimes there are a few schools that wait until like September or October to send us their spring graduation lists. Uh, and so then when we see the non-respondents, there's really not a lot we can do. Some of them have moved far away and, you know, for sure their, you know, snail mail address has changed. Their phone had address has changed. Maybe an email address is good, but it makes it much more difficult. So being timely with the grad lists really does help us. And we also now offer an API, an application programming interface. Um, instead of sending copies of the certificate of completion emails that students get after they finish the SED, you know, we send those to schools as well as to the students. Um, you don't have to organize all of those or put them any place this automatically pings us and that we send you those names directly to your database. So it can hopefully reduce your burden. Next. So institutional participation is critical. I think I've already talked about the first several bullets, but I would like to hear from you about ways of making SED data of more use to institutions, because we really do believe that if institutions use the data, that they'll be more willing to participate. And second, are there tools that we could provide you to help you directly prompt non-responding graduates? Anyway, any ideas that you have as well as any questions, I will open to hearing from you. So John. Great, thank you so oh, much, oh, Pat. Oh, sorry. This yeah, was a ahead. last minute change. I Please need go ahead. One minute to talk about privacy and confidentiality. Please. It's my fault. Next. So we really do take privacy and confidentiality very serious because SCD is an unusual survey in that it's a census, not a sample. And um, everyone earning a research doctorate in the US is included. So that means this target population is highly visible. I mean, their CVs are easily online. 
So you could find somebody who, you know, got their PhD from the University of Minnesota in, you know, 1982, who's a female and whose field of study was in physics. And with that, you know, there aren't too many of those people. And so they are highly identifiable. And so that is why this data is um, protected. So these concerns require we review any data that we release goes, you know, through a disclosure review, and we take that very seriously. But NSF, go to the next slide, is also very concerned that people have new ways to access and use the data. So in a few minutes, um, Peter is going to be talking to you about some of those new methods. And we are trying to make it easier and easier for people to do this. So over to you, John. Great. Thank you, Pat. That was very informative. So um, we have uh, a question from Deborah Charlesworth. Deborah, if you'd like to ask that live, go ahead and unmute your video and audio. I'll wait a second for you to acclimate. Great. Hi, Hi Deborah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, I, I hadn't heard about the API yet, and I, I work with my colleague who collects the SED data, but I'm sort of the technology person in our graduate school. Does that integrate with the banner databases? Do you, do you know? Banner is a pretty common database for universities. I think you're muted, Patricia. Right. It is. I, I am not sure about that, but I can get back to you with that answer. Great. I'd like that. Thank you. Good question here. Um, so um, I had a question, which I think derived from your website here. Over the life of the SED, um, the survey is going uh, to consistently attain response rates exceeding 90% um, from doctoral recipients, as you had mentioned. Um, while the study is voluntary, um, uh, we found that most of the graduates find reasons for completing the survey compelling. What advice can you give institutions to compel students to complete the survey? For example, what, what key items, a handful of items that are really compelling to the student to actually um, make them interested to participate? Or what's the top several reasons? In the communications like brochures we do for students, one of the big things is the use of the data. You know, we point them to some of the products coming out and the fact that decisions about future graduate programs are going to be made in part on SED data. And, you know, it's the way of getting their voice and experience heard. Um, and as I said before, a lot of people, the fact that it is the National Science Foundation that's funding this. Um, I mean, I think they do see the scientific integrity of the, the data collection and so are confident that, you know, their data is going to be protected. Uh, Peter, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, you know, I think in, in this day and age, um, one thing you might want to talk about is um, sort of diversity and equality, um, because what one of the things that the SED does is it's the only, um, you know, reliable source for the number of minorities that are receiving doctorates across the nation, research doctorates across the nation in different fields, by field. And so this is, if they, if we have their responses, it really helps um, universities understand the availability of doctorates by race and ethnicity um, and citizenship and uh, you know helps helps with planning and disability status too yeah yeah great great yeah i think there are you know many valid reasons both at the student level for why they would want their field to be enhanced their institution to be enhanced by the analytics from this and certainly the institutions in terms of uh, future planning you know i think it's invaluable information so a lot of that i think is up to the front lines people to you know be able to effectively communicate that and pass on the information from um, the survey of earned doctorates um, about these compelling reasons um so um we have a question from roxy roxanne treese roxanne if you'd like to ask your question live Go ahead and unmute your audio and video. And if not, I'll be happy to read the questions aloud. Okay. So I'll go ahead and read Roxanne's question. We require students to complete the SED prior to graduation, um, but I'm waiting for the day that a student challenges this requirement. Um, any advice? 
could um, a student only complete part of the survey? Yes, a student can skip any questions they want. That's on the like opening screen. There is an informed consent um, that they can read through that says skip any question that they want. So that's certainly a possibility. We actually have had people that have um, completed the survey, but then afterwards regret having done it, and they <laughs> call and ask us to repeat their information, and we will do that. One, you know, that only happens once in a while. That's not a common occurrence. So, and, um, you know, this varies by institution, institution, what their regulations are about like assessment activities. A lot of times, like in the college catalog, which is sort of the contract with the students, there is mention of participating in assessment activities or depending on how evaluations, whatever which does give um, them some leeway. You know, I've never really heard of anything really becoming a legal challenge. I know that every once in a while, it, you know, it does go to the University General Council and they tweak the language that maybe is used on the dissertation checklist. Um, but so far, you know, there are a couple of universities who want students to opt in, which is, it's a whole lot of work for them. And, you know, it does definitely reduce the response rates. But um, again, I think it is just examining the language and we can send you if you, what we think is good language to use. No, that's good, that's very helpful. It's interesting too that I think we've gone from you know, uh, years ago, it used to be much more of a, considered a compliance issue. And now, as you yeah. mentioned earlier, in reflecting the change of the title, it's more of, um, to compel people if they have, they're informed and they know the reasons for why the survey is done and how they can improve their the situation in their field or whatever at their institution. Um, people are much more likely to um, participate. And uh, so, you know, I think gone are the days or most of the schools say, you know, thou shalt, you must. And, but, you know, just say, here's the part of the normal process that we do and you know um, here's the link to it and then people have additional guided information if you know they have questions or are not quite sure about it but i think these days compliance is less of an issue it's just more about compelling people to you know uh, convince them you know that's the right thing to do and i don't think at many institutions it's an issue janice robinson had just one brief comment here at brigham young university and we made the sed a required item to be cleared before we approve the graduation uh, we approved for graduation. It works great. Um, the email notice um, that it is completed comes to our staff and so it's easy to clear. So Janice, thanks for your comment there. So I guess um, we should probably jump into the um, Peter's portion of um, the presentation. Yep. And we're going till two o'clock here and we'll entertain some more questions along the way here or after great. as well. Thank great. you. Thank you. Oh, Peter, if you wanted to share a movie, um, the icon next to the screen share, I think is, it looks like a YouTube icon in the middle. I think that's actually, if it's a YouTube video, you could use that. It's not a YouTube video, unfortunately. I embedded it in okay. the program. All right, but we'll okay. cross our fingers so, if you want to Yeah, we'll, we'll cross our fingers. If it doesn't work, I'll just describe it, and, uh, and, and we can send links to yeah. those that are interested to the tool. So Thank you. Um, so my name is Peter Ainaudi. I worked with Pat for a long time on different surveys. And what I'm talking to you today about is, uh, you know, sort of how the SED data are used. Um, and they're used by uh, various entities, so researchers, federal and state agencies, as well as our universities. I would say our universities are probably the biggest users. Um, but they're, they're really used to evaluate um, the pipeline of doctors coming into uh, the program, into the workforce, they're used to evaluate, to do program evaluation, uh, to make decisions about whether the financial resources going into different fields are appropriate and, and, and or the mechanisms that people use to fund their graduate students are sufficient. Um, they are used to inform government policy as well. Um, this is really focused on institutional uses, and we actually went out and talked to several of our um, respondents over the last year, talking about how do they use the SED data. And uh, we got 
the, the, the three, well, the two main uses are for program planning and institutional reporting. Um, so generic institutional reporting about, you know, what are the demographics of our graduating um, doctorate holders? What are their postgraduate plans? What were their funding sources? How long did it take for them to, to um, finish their degree? Things like that, the level of debt. Um, in terms of planning and peer analysis, though, you know, the SCD has a lot of really um, great potential. Um, a, a lot of people, as Pat mentioned, um, request their own data. And so you can use that data to do all sorts of nice things. And I'm actually going to go down one slide briefly to show you, like, this is um, a graph that one of the, the our respondents used in their um, annual report that looks at the funding and the change in funding uh, for graduate students or for doctoral students um, between 2015 and 2019. Um, you know, this is for their data, but it could easily be expanded to, um, you know, a national data set. So you could say, what is our university? What is the um, funding? What are the funding mechanisms we use compared to our peers? Um, and so they do, um, respondents do, uh, are all of you and, uh, and other respondents do use the data to benchmark um, their programs uh, by field and Carnegie classification. Um, the other thing that sometimes is used is to look at, well, who's doing inter, um, interdisciplinary research? How many people are doing interdisciplinary research? And um, what fields are they in? Um, and then how does that compare to how other other schools and other um, and other doctoral recipients report whether or not they do interdisciplinary research? Um, and a final use is actually using these data as potentially um, sources for your exit surveys um, or potentially if you wanted to change your taxonomies and over time, um, we're doing, we're constantly working on taxonomies, uh, and I apologize for the phone in the background. Um, so um, looking at how NSF or, um, well, as Pat said, we just started to use the SIP code, which is the Department of Ed's um, uh, SIP classifications for field, field of study. Um, all right. So how do you, how do people access the data? Um, and I, I'll say that there are many ways to access the data. Perhaps the best uh, starting point is to go to the regularly produced reports. So there are a series of annual reports that are produced by NSF as well as the National Science Board. Um, you can also request your, your institution's data, and then there are several data tools um, that I'm going to show, show you briefly um, that you can use to look across institutions. Um, and then finally, the, the, the last way is to actually ask for a data request or analysis uh, through the project officer or through our website uh, for specific data if you can't get it through these other sources. Um, so the, the, the primary mechanism I would point you to is, um, it's, we call it the digest, but it's an annual report. Um, if you go to this website that's up at the top, NSF.gov statistics SED. It'll take you to this um, this slide, and there are two two main sections. There's the reports and the data tables. The report is a, a um, you know it's a summary of the key topics that the analysts at NCSES have decided are the most uh, interesting in this particular year. So it varies year by year. Um, it has text associated with all of the graphics. Uh, the figures are um, interactive, so you can move your cursor over them and it'll tell you the, the data points. You can also, on many of the figures, take out a line if you're only interested in U.S. citizens, as an example. And it was, and it, it, uh, the initial slide talks about U.S. citizens and uh, foreign nationals. Um, it covers a lot of different things. Uh, typically, it's, it's meant to be an overview to touch on um, the main the main ideas that are uh, of interest to the analysts at NCSES. Um, there's also 77 data tables that are produced annually. Um, they cover um, most of the data that we collect. 
uh, financial support, educational history of doctoral recipients, fields uh, and demographic characteristics of doctoral recipients, uh, postgraduate commitments and plans. That's a one that is often uh, of interest to universities and other stakeholders. Um, Peter, you only have about five minutes left. Okay, thank you. So and then we also produce a series of um, annual tables, supplemental tables that are that are available by request uh, because they they do not suppress any of the data in the tables, uh, but they show by detailed field, sex, race, ethnicity, um, counts of doctorate recipients, as well as the baccalaureate origins of those doctorate recipients. Um, and actually, the baccalaureate origins is one of the most requested tables. Um, I would just want to point out two uh, congressionally mandated reports that, again, are excellent sources uh, of data about the state of science and engineering and about uh, sort of the equity issues. And the, these, while these are our cross-survey um, reports, the SED is, in, is utilized in both of these every year. Um, and so that's part of what we do is we support the authors of these reports as well. Um, Every institution that has at least 25 doctorates uh, over the last um, five years um, will get a institutional profile. Uh, this is sent to the SED coordinator as well as the dean of the graduate school, and as of last year, the VP of research. If you've not seen this report, it's a really interesting report. It shows your school and it get, does a peer analysis where, where the peers are the other institutions in your Carnegie classification. Um, it's a six or eight page, depending on the size of your school, the number of doctorate recipients you have um, documents. And it shows, it basically does a breakdown of um, mo many of the items that we collect uh, and compares you to the your Carnegie classifications. And for many, it's also for the national average. Um, in terms of institutional data files, you can request historic data for your institution from 1920 to the most recently published uh, year of data. Um, this is something that you can do straight from the, the website. Um, Pat also talked about getting your preliminary data. You can get that and you can um, link it to your exit surveys as an example, as, as a way to, you know, add context, um, add additional data to your, to your exit surveys. Um, all these data are, in, are provided uh, through a secure transcription. Um, and with Excel and ASCII formats, as well as SAS and SPSS code to read in and apply variables. Um, for all of these, data use agreements are required, um, but there are two tools that you can use. So one, um, you can. this is the NCSES data tool. Uh, you can get to by going to ncsesdata.nsf.gov. Again, this goes across all their surveys, but this isn't just an example showing 2019, the distribution of men and women across race, ethnicity. Um, but you can see on the left-hand side, the variables that are uh, available here. Unfortunately, it's a fairly small set of variables. Um, so part of the, the reason for doing that is, is really because of the, the potential for disclosure for this uh, population. So most of the things that you might be interested in uh, looking at aren't available here. Mostly it's just demographics and counts. Um, so uh, NCSES has agreed to um, work on a new file called the RDAS, um, a new system, it's, and it's really intended to help you do analysis of a much broader set of variables. Um, no institution level data can be done here, but you can uh, do a broader set of, of analyses. It's based on a sample, um, and so it provides uh, weighted estimates um, a, a variety of statistics. It's very intuitive and fast. Um, there, I was going to show you a video, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, that that sort of walks you through um, this. It is in beta testing, um, and so it is something that uh, if you're interested in doing, please let Pat or I know or the survey know. We'll send you a um, the instructions for getting onto the beta testing group. Um, we're really excited about it, and so we hope you you actually take us up on this. Um, and then 
Oh yeah, so customer data requests. So this is the last thing. So if you can't get the data that you need through the these data tools or through the reports that are out there, um, you can write up a request um, and things that are typically done through these types of requests other than getting your own data include like 30 year trend analyses or um, there's something called the institutional yield, um, which is, you know, you're looking at bachelor's or uh, degrees, or bachelor institutions to see of these people. So you've seen lists probably of which batch, which bachelor level schools produce the most doctor, doctor recipients, right? So, but, but that really privileges the large schools. So one of the things that NS, NCSES has done is they've come up with a way of using the iPads data to say sort of what percentage of graduates of a school go on to a doctorate degree. Um, that's the type of thing that really can't be done um, through the data that's available, but we could help you do that. Um, so that's the overview. Um, if you have any questions. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, so I just wanted to add a comment here, at least in the time when I was handling survey and doctorates, <clears throat> it seemed to me at our institution there were two lines of reporting, one for the front lines person who handles, you know, contact the students to do the survey and so forth and sending the graduation lists. And then there was another level at West Virginia University, they had a, um, a decentralized um, office of graduate affairs and those folks actually um, had access to the institutional reporting and data and the communications back and forth from the folks at survey for doctorates and I did not necessarily see those communications but I think it would be a good idea that for the front line front lines people whether you're in the libraries or the graduate school to talk to the folks who could be in your graduate school or an office of institutional analysis and planning um, who receive those communications and receive the reporting for that so that you're all on the same page and aware, particularly the higher up administrative folks in your grad school or, or a planning office, um, that these resources are available. Um, and sometimes, sometimes a quick email, um, you know, will pave the way for that conversation and, you know, can open up, you know, a lot of other things, avenues as well. Um, yeah, so, to that point, if you if you haven't seen the institutional profile for your institution, you might want to contact the graduate school dean, or you could contact us directly. And I think we could probably send it directly to you. But um, Pat, do you think that's true? I'm I'm not a hundred percent because they do sign something or you know uh, yeah. said not to be released beyond the institution. But we could, and now our database, we don't just track the coordinator and the graduate dean. There are multiple people involved in this, and so those multiple people are in our database. And I'm sure that we could probably send it to any of any of those people. So if you want it, just ask us and we'll figure something out. Great, great. Um, do you all have a link, um, publicly available link to that video, or is it because it's in beta testing, you have to just request by email or whatever your process is? Um. We don't yeah. have a link right now, but we're thinking about okay. putting one up. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, let, let us know and we'll be happy to you know, even post it from our website. Um, I think that'll be a very valuable resource uh, for and folks. And we can send a link to people for the uh, the actual RDAS so they can go in and, and play with it. Great, great. Okay, it's very helpful. Um, just looking through the Q&A tab here, um, Sally Evans had a follow-up to um, Janice Robinson's comment. Um, Sally says, Janice, we do the same at George Mason University. I get the notification that the student has completed the survey and I will not process their submission materials until I receive it. So interesting, various levels of compliance, carrots and sticks and so forth. But sometimes it's a trick is just to trick the student into thinking that it's really required when it's technically not, and then give them reasons for, you know, compelling reasons why if they beg the question further. Janice, yes, we have a PowerPoint actually posted in our presentation. This PowerPoint presentation is in our presentations um, uh, web page. Um, so you can take a look at that immediately. Um, can you give some practical examples of how institutions have used their SED data to analyze degree equity? Yes, actually, um, the custom requests that we receive two thirds of them really address equity issues. They're asking for data on women, minorities, you know, citizens, non-citizens, 
and often by field and either by like sort of fine fields and often over a long period of time to see how those distributions have changed. So I think also um, a lot of affirmative action offices use SCD data to gauge the sort of population of people eligible to become assistant professors in a given area. You know, if there are 100 graduates in a year, PhDs in a certain field, what percentage of them are white, underrepresented minorities or, or women, so they can see what their recruiting pool really should look like and compare to what they actually got. Yes, great. So that comes full circle from, you know, passing the students on and then the graduate to the recruiting cycle of the new incoming fold. And, uh, you know, so you can see how this all ties together. I think that's a very useful and practical example. Um, Stacy Wallace at the University of Florida says, uh, we require the survey for doctorates um, for a deg uh, degree award. However, students can choose to fill, uh, fill in uh, what they want. Uh, which would be fine, but then we are notified to complete the missing information report. And then she follows up, it is not our policy to release student information without their consent, hence the 99% uh, response rate rather than 100%. Do other institutions provide this data on behalf of their students? Yes, and typically those missing information rosters, we only send, um, we only request them for people who are total non-respondents. For people who just didn't answer a question, skipped over it, we consider that question to be refused and we won't ask for it. It used to be years back that they did. There was a, uh, that we asked it for everybody, but that's no longer the case. It is for the total non-respondents that, you know, we could never locate or they never gave us anything. Okay, great. Um, I have another question here. Um, does uh, FERPA apply to the SED? Uh, Family that, Education that, you know, FERPA. Yeah, no, I know what it is. Um, yeah, because the data is also sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education, it is allowed. I mean, there's no FERPA. You know, FERPA definitely allows SED that institutions can release data directly to um, the SED. Okay, very good. Um, oh, here's a good one. Um, what is a, an SED microdata uh, and how can one obtain it? Well, the only way you can get microdata is through a restricted use license. Right now, like all that, we're developing the data analysis tools that will hopefully let people um, do the analysis they want and you know they'll get more sophisticated over time. But releasing actual microdata files is, not part of the planning, just because there would be too big of a risk of disclosure. I see. And, uh, and so and, and specifically micro data, then that drills down at the fine tooth level of, you know, the, the, I guess it doesn't, the general generalized data tables don't include those nuances or how, how is it differentiated? Well, the RDAS does, I mean, it's based on micro data. Micro data is loaded in there and then you can manipulate it there. And so you can produce your table. Someday you can probably be able to produce regression and trend analysis. That's not there yet. Um, but you can never actually see the record, you know, that has, you know, not even Peter Inadi that would have my information, University of Michigan graduate, you know, 1989. Um, and, and that it's just, Again, since this population is so identifiable, it would be very hard to actually make a public use micro data set unless it only contained a very limited number of variables. And that sure, sure. Would be very useful. Yeah, so it's a mainly an internal use kind of uh, uh, analytic. Okay, uh, very good. So our time is up, gang. I would like very much to thank um, uh, Patricia Green and Peter Inaudi for joining us. It's been a very informative and um, let's keep up this dialogue. I, um, years ago, we've had representatives from the Survey of Aaron Doctorates, and it's been almost a decade, so we're delighted to have you join us, and uh, we're happy to help participate in uh, creating this national data set. Yeah. Well, thank, well, thank you, you so for much. having us. You people are very important to us, so, you know, if you need something, just let us know. We shall. Thank you. All right. Take okay. care, all. Right. Um, everyone, join us in five minutes uh, for the next set of uh, uh, breakout sessions, and thanks again. 
Thank you.